have um, our reading today, which is a bit different. Jeff, if you could highlight both me and Val, please, for the reading. Um, so that the two of us are both spotlighted, if you can do that. <laughs> I think you can spotlight two. I discovered last week you could spotlight two people. I've done that, but it doesn't necessarily go through on the Facebook. <laughs> OK. Now, two. we're going to have... We're going to have a long reading today. Now, some people like listening to audio books and our reading today is going to be a bit like listening to an audio book. It's not that long, I promise. It's just a bit longer than a normal reading. Our reading today is selections from once the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 9, 10 and 11. We're going to be exploring today the story of how the first king of Israel was chosen and came to be king. His name was Saul. And he was chosen by God and acclaimed by the people and anointed by Samuel. But it's quite a long, complex story. And it's told over three chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, that chapters 9, 10, and 11. And it might help if you have your Bible uh, in front of you, either on your phone or in your, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, an actual book an actual Bible book, uh, because um, there's going to be bits of this we're going to read and there's going to be other bits of it that we're going to skip over. And I'm going to tell you about the bits we're missing out. So Val is going to help me with this. Val is going to read to us some sections of 1 Samuel chapter 9, 10 and 11. And then when we miss out verses, uh, we're missing out verses, not because they don't matter, but because they... Um, uh they're not necessarily relevant directly to this story and i'm going to summarize those verses and then we'll go back to the story to uh tell the tell the story in full so i want you to listen uh the way you would to an audio book to the story of the calling of king saul in 1 samuel chapter 9 10 and 11 and this is how it begins Val is going to read to us I can hear sounds off now, so if we can just uh, have, if everyone else can be muted except Val and myself, that would be good. Val, have you got something else, some other sound source there, some Facebook on or something? I think you might my, have. My, 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 my internet was going, but you're okay. Um... okay. Okay. I think you've got some feedback there. I'm sorry. Bit. There was a Benjamite. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorah, the son of a fire of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father Kish were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Felicia. But they didn't find them. They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. And then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they didn't find them. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Now we're missing out a few verses where they have a discussion, all of it, a discussion about whether they have enough money to pay the prophet. And we take up the story at verse 14. They went up to the town and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming towards them on his way to the high place. 
Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I've looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, That's the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I'm the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place. For today you are to eat with me. And in the morning I'll send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys that you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They've been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? So Saul and the servant have a meal with Samuel, and Saul gets given the best piece of meat to designate that he's the guest of honour. And then Samuel calls Saul up onto the roof of his house because he's got for him a special message from God. And so we pick up the story again at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 10. And Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzar on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He's asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to the Gilbeah of God, Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, pipes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. So uh, the story continues that Saul does leave Samuel and we're told how every one of these things that Samuel said would happen does happen. And they came up, come about just as Samuel said, and Saul is filled with God's Holy Spirit. And then mm -hmm. from verse 17 of that chapter, we see how Samuel reports back to the people who had demanded a king. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you've said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves to the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel had made all Israel come forward by tribe, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, 
clan by clan and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he wasn't to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he's hidden among the supplies. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the, all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And then the people shouted, long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. Some scandal said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. So we're getting there. By the end of chapter 10, the people have a king, as they demanded. Uh, they have a king in theory, but it actually doesn't seem that he's doing anything in practice, and it seems to have made no difference. But then in chapter 11, the king has to prove himself. So let's hear a bit of the story from chapter 11 as well. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, make a treaty with us and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Israel, the elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days so that we can send messages throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen and he asked, what's wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? And then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel proclaiming this is what will be done to the oxen of everyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. And then the terror of the Lord fell on the people and they came out together as one. When Saul mustered them at Bezek the men of Israel numbered 300,000 and those of Judah 30,000. So Saul has brought together an army and with his fighting force, he goes out and defeats the Ammonites. And Samuel then brings the nation together to finally and completely confirm Saul as the king. And our reading ends with chapter 11 from verse 14. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord. And Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. The end. Thank you, Val. Thank you for uh, sharing that reading with me, for doing that reading for us. Thank you for... Um, that, very, that must be one of the longest readings we've ever had in church. Three chapters. But I think it's important to, to sometimes to take big chunks of the Bible and sometimes in our devotions, sometimes we read just a couple of verses and we can really, you know, relish the verse, a couple of verses or just a few words and let them sink deep into our hearts. But sometimes we have to read big passages of scripture to get the idea of how God is working, particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, but sometimes in the New Testament as well, to get the whole scope of Scripture. 
Uh, in this series that we're doing at the moment, we're looking at the history of the nation of Israel, particularly in the early days of the kings of Israel. If, if you remember last time, two weeks ago, we saw the leaders of the tribes of Israel. Uh, this is in the time of the judges. Uh, they came to Samuel and they said, we want a king so we can be like the other nations. And Samuel said, you're going to regret it. But God said, well, if that's what they want, let them have a king. So today we meet the man who will be king. And the, his becoming king um, takes a long time. The man chosen to be king, uh, anointed by Samuel, chosen by God, is Saul. But it takes these three chapters, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11, over a lengthy period of time, it takes all these three chapters for Saul to be chosen and anointed and acclaimed and finally confirmed as the king of the tribes of Israel and Judah. And sorry about the spoilers, but Saul is going to be a failure as a king. He's consistently going to choose his own way rather than God's way. He's consistently going to be doing things in his own strength and authority rather than God's. He's going to go on to consult mediums and summon ghosts. He's going to take on the role of priest, which he's never entitled to. And his failures are going to lead to depression and mental illness. And he will finally fight a war against and then be deposed by and replaced by King David. The New Bible Dictionary, uh, which is a, a reference book that many of us uh, have as a, a staple dictionary that we look at uh, to look at Bible names. The New Bible Dictionary, which is normally quite um, independent and, and, and keeps a middle ground on things. Under the directory, the entry for Saul says, Saul was one of the most pathetic of God's servants. <laughs> I thought that was bizarre finding that entry. One of the most pathetic of God's servants. And yet he was one of God's servants. Maybe Saul isn't the greatest hero in the Bible, but maybe we can learn from his faults and failings. And maybe also we can be encouraged that Saul was chosen and used by God, even though he wasn't the best of people, and even though he was such a failure. Because God uses me and God uses you, even though we're far from being perfect. So I want to start by asking, why does God choose one person and not another? And how can God use you and me, despite our failings? What do we know about Saul when God chooses him? Well, we know quite a bit, but let's not get carried away and think these are the qualifications for being a king. We know he was from a good family. His father, Kish, we're told, was a man of standing, by which we take it to mean he had lots of money, he was wealthy. We're given a long genealogy of his father and grandfather and great grandfather that he came from important family within the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the, um, uh, the more favored tribes of Israel. He had wealth and influence that might impress people. He had servants uh, that might make him a popular candidate for, for, for high office. But it really shouldn't have anything to do with God's choosing. It really shouldn't. He was strong and tall. He was physically impressive. Head and shoulders, we're told twice in these chapters, head and shoulders above all the others. And looks matter when people choose a leader. They like choosing people who look good. Um, and looks might get him the popular vote, but they don't impress God. We'll see that in the choice of the next king, David that God is concerned about what's in our character, not with what we look like. But in the eyes of the world, looks matter. But that shouldn't be part of what is involved in choosing someone as king. Now, we do know about Saul that he was 
worldly minded. And that certainly shouldn't be part of what's involved in being God's chosen anointed king. He was worldly minded. In chapter nine, we see Saul sent out to find some donkeys for his father. The donkeys, part of his father's livestock, which would have been used as pack animals, uh, they got lost. They'd wandered far and wide and, uh, and, and Saul was sent out with a servant to find these donkeys. Now, I can't help thinking that Saul can't have been all that valuable to his father on the work of his estate, if that's what we're to understand was going on here. If Saul was sent out to look for donkeys, now donkeys are important, I suppose. But if Saul had been a key official in his father's business, it wouldn't have been Saul who'd been sent out on this wild donkey chase, would it? Well, he can't find the lost donkeys. Uh, and they go in to, to, to ask the local prophet Although actually it's not Samuel who says, let's go and ask God's prophet where these donkeys are. It's the servant who has more spiritual discernment and says, let's go and ask this local prophet who happens to be Samuel, the greatest of all the prophets, if he knows where the donkeys are. And then they meet Samuel, which is the turning point of Saul's life. But what Saul worried about, he's still more worried about the donkeys. That's how worldly minded he is. In verse 20, while all the uh, this is verse 20 of chapter 9. All the hopes and the desires and the nations are turned on this one man, Saul, who is to be their king. What Saul fixated on is still fix fixated on his dad's donkeys. And Samuel has to say to him in verse 20, as for these donkeys you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They've been found. Samuel knows all about the donkeys. He's got insight from the Lord about donkeys. And he's got insight from the Lord about who's to be the next king. So Samuel says, the donkeys have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Wow. He says, Saul, get your priorities sorted out. Stop having your mind focused on some lost donkeys and think about where the Lord's desire is turned, which is to the calling God has on your life. But Saul can't get it. We also know that Saul is pretty, if he's worldly minded, he's also fairly cowardly. Because later in chapter 10, verse 17, that gathering at Mizpah for Samuel to reveal uh, through God's providence who is to be chosen as king. Uh, you, you remember that episode that we just read about how the people come forward tribe by tribe which tribe is it going to be it's going to be the tribe of benjamin which clan is it going to be it's going to be this clan which family is it going to be it's going to be this family which individual is it going to be it's going to be saul where's saul he's not here he's gone to ground he's hiding from the inevitable he's hiding in the baggage he's hiding in the in the bag store this is his moment. Saul is to be confirmed as king. An eager nation is awaiting him. And he's not there. If you watched um, Joe Biden's inauguration as US president recently, it was as if the whole world was watching the inauguration. All the, Everyone had lined up to, uh, to welcome the new president. And then Joe Biden hadn't turned up. He was in the cloakroom. What's going on? Saul is hiding the unwilling king. Ironically, Saul's unwillingness to be king is perhaps the only quality that he has that makes him suitable for the job. Saul is, in worldly terms, unsuitable. And yet, now here's the rub, here's the crucial point. And yet, into the life of this tall, strong, rich, worldly, cowardly young man, God breaks in. All sorts of coincidences start happening. Things that we Christians would call God incidences. God is at work in the life of this young man. He happens to meet Samuel just at that time and place. Yeah, the Lord had that in mind. 
He happens to meet a group of prophets as he leaves Samuel, a group of prophets who are going to bless him with the presence of God's Holy Spirit. That's God at work. And then when it comes to choosing the king by, by lottery, by throwing dice or whatever they did, picking sticks, we're not told what method they use, but by some method of lot, from the tribes and clans of the people, the lot happens to fall on Saul. God's at work here. You, says Samuel, you are the chosen one. Don't ask me why. I don't know why it's you. But God has chosen you. Saul gets invited in that earlier chapter to share a meal with the great prophet and gets the best cut of meat, the best cut that would be reserved for the king or the special one. And it's for Saul because Saul is the chosen one. Samuel anoints Saul with oil, the sign of God's choosing and blessing as the oil runs down from him. It's a sign and a uh, not just a sign, not just symbolic, but it's the actual uh, giving to him of the presence of God's blessing. Because when God chooses you, he blesses you. When God calls you, he equips you. Saul was in every respect totally unsuitable for this job. And yet God calls him and God blesses him. God doesn't just have a job planned for you. He has a blessing planned for you. And I mean you, every one of us. And when Saul obeys, when he does what Samuel says, when he, he goes out and meets this band of wandering prophets on the way home from some charismatic knees up, it says in verse 10, uh, the spirit of God came upon him. The spirit of God came upon him. And in, and in that final chapter, in chapter 11, we see it again. Saul has been acclaimed king and he doesn't seem to be doing the job of king in any way. He's working in his fields. That's not what kings normally do. He's gone back to plowing his land. King me, a king. I'm just getting on with my farming. Uh, but then he hears there's trouble in Jabesh Gilead, which is a border town on the other side of the Jordan in the what, what in modern terms is in the nation of Jordan, not in the nation of Israel, uh, an area there which was kind of the, the badlands, the borderlands on the border with the Ammonite territory. And um, they've been threatened, they've been attacked, they're going to be disgraced. And Saul hears about this, and it says in chapter 11, verse 6, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. And he brought the nation together against their enemy. Something that no other person could do, bringing the whole nation together, both the North Israel and the South Judah, coming together in a mighty force against the enemy. Actually, this episode sounds a lot like what we read earlier in the scriptures in the book of Judges, where Samson or one of those other great leaders were filled with the spirit to lead the people for a particular purpose. Saul sounds like one of those mighty judges from earlier in the Bible. And then by the end of chapter 11, Saul is finally and completely confirmed as a king because the people see not only is he a capable leader, but he is God's chosen leader who has by now started taking is calling seriously. The people have asked for a leader. God has chosen a leader. The leader has been anointed. The leader has been crucially filled with God's spirit and has taken on the calling that God has put on his life. Oh, it's taken a long time. But eventually it's happened. There's two ways of doing any good thing. We can do a good thing in one of two ways. One way is to do it in our own strength, according to our own judgment. It's a good thing, but we can decide to do it the way we choose. The other way is to do a good thing by God's spirit, by God's purpose, by the power and presence of God 
in and through us. It's a good thing, but it's better and it's perfectly done when we do it in the strength and power of God. What should set us apart of the people of God is that we are led by God. Those who do not have Christ in their lives can still do good things, but we as the people of God, with Christ in us, filled with the Holy Spirit, should be doing good things that are also godly things led by God's Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, you'll know this verse. It says this, not by might and not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Not by might. And not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That's Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. We can do good things, but we can do them by this power of the spirit of God. And Saul gets a taste here in these chapters as we work through chapter 9, chapter 10, and then into chapter 11. Saul gets a taste of God's power and God's presence doing the good thing by God's spirit and through his power. And through the rest of his life, Saul's going to need much more of the same. Hmm. The tragedy is, as we'll find out, that he spends most of his reign as king following his own ways, good or bad things, but doing them in his own strength. So what can we learn from this? Let's do three, three quick things that we can learn from this. I won't keep you much longer. Three quick things that we can learn from this story of Saul receiving the kingship. Number one, God can use us whoever we are. <laughs> whoever you are, whoever we are, God can use us. And that means you. Whether you're big or small or strong or weak, uh, old or young, female, male, whatever, God can take your time, your life, your skills, your heart, and make them something precious to God. Your part is to open up your strengths and your weaknesses to God and give him your successes and your failures, your skills and your inadequacies, and give them over to God. And say, here I am, God, use me. God will fill you with his spirit and help you to work for his kingdom if you are willing. God can use you. He used Saul. And look what a mess Saul was. He can use you. None of us is too inadequate. None of us is underqualified for God. <laughs> By his spirit, he can use each of us. Number two is this. God makes the most surprising choices. It's not for us to choose. Who would have chosen Saul? Well, perhaps someone who was in a, a tallest person to be king competition. But wh why choose Saul? We don't know. Why did God choose anyone he chose? Why did God choose Abraham? Why did God choose any of his people? I'm reminded of that poem by Ogden Nash, a two-line poem which goes like this. How odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> uh, why did God choose his chosen people? And why did God choose any individual? He chose you and me to be his children. I love that hymn that says, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Yeah, me, even me, you, even you. He chooses unexpected people for unexpected positions. We have to be slow to judge by outward appearance. We have to listen to the voice of God spoken to us and to others. When Samuel chose David to succeed Saul, by listening to the voice of God, he said, people look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We'll be coming to David in a few weeks. God may choose you when you least expect it, even though you're the 
most unlikely candidate for whatever it is. Who me? Yes, you. God makes the most surprising choices. That's number two. And number three is this. We need God to fill us up. We need God's presence and purpose. We need God's power in us all the time. God was chosen. Saul was chosen by God and was anointed with oil. That was a symbolic filling, but he needed actually to be filled with the spirit. And he was. God met him and filled him. Whenever God used Saul for his purposes, it was after he'd been touched by God's spirit. Whenever Saul acted in his own strength, he messed up. We need God's strength by the power of his spirit in us all the time, every day, relying on God's strength in us. Each day we need to say, Lord, fill me up again with your presence and power by your, by your purpose lived through me. Living for Jesus isn't easy, but the scriptures say we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can do what God calls us to do and be the people he calls us to be because what, where God calls, he also equips. And if you're feeling like giving in today, then consider Saul, who made a mess of following God when he acted in his own strength, but somehow he won the great victories for the Lord when he allowed God to do it his way. So as we finish, look to God, learn from Saul, good and bad, and keep on being filled with his spirit. God worked in history, and he can make you and me part of his plans for his history when he chooses us and when we make ourselves available to him. Let's pray.